one. Well, good morning, everyone. The time is 8.41 a.m. on Thursday, March 21st. Is today actually a significant day? Is it like this first day of spring or something today? Or an equinox? In, in India, it's the holy colors. Yes. Happy oh, wow. Okay, I thought the... Anyway. Um, joining us today, we have a couple of special guests. We have Beth Ostrander, who is here in Toronto. Beth is a pleasure coach, speaker, and certified erotic blueprint coach. Good morning, Beth. Good morning. And I love it because I'm watching us live right now. Sound is good. Awesome. <laughs> and joining us live from Goa, India, from the future, no less is Heidi Lepke. Hi. <laughs> how is it how is it in the future, Heidi? Do people do people still speak English a day from now? Sometimes <laughs> only me. All right. Well we've been having uh, some great conversations before we went live, so we thought we would continue the conversation. Um, good morning to a couple of people who have already joined us. Good morning, Elena, Lalita, and Stacy and Beth. Oh, wait, it's the same Beth that's here. Okay, she's it's me. cloned herself. I'm there too. <laughs> Creepy. I'm actually trying to put us live here, so or on my my thing as well. Great. Thanks uh, for joining, everyone. Um, so Heidi, if you'd like to do any sharing as well, you can take some time to do that. I think I'm actually going to wait until after. Well, yeah, I'm going to wait till after. So, um, Heidi, for those who have not met you yet or seen any of your previous videos, would you like to introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about the work that you do? Sure, yeah. So my full name, for those of you who don't know me, I can't see it on the screen, is Heidi Lepke. And uh, my, my work, my life, is Tantra. And to me, what that means is the practice of making everything a spiritual practice. So I teach people how to make eating a spiritual practice, how to make um, relationships and conversations and emotions, and uh, also sex, even though <laughs> it's a small percentage of what I do, because Tantra is like a big tree with one branch being sexuality. Uh, I want everyone to move from black and white TVs to color plasma highly pixelated TV where every moment feels better and tastes better and uh, is brighter. And that's the tool that I found is the most effective. So I teach workshops. Um, I actually created a, a really cool event called Tantric Speed Dating, which is a little bit of an oxymoron because we often <laughs> Tantra with taking our time and slowness and then we can put together with speed dating and it creates this like wondrous opportunity for conscious singles to come together and determine compatibility in deeper ways. So are you compatible on an energetic level? Are you compatible with smell? Are you compatible with your inner child's get along? There's all these ways that in a lot of speed dating events or a dating world in general you miss. So that was a something that just kind of got downloaded. Uh, and I've had a lot of fun with that. And uh, I do coaching for couples and for individuals who want to have more, um, more fulfillment in life and be more, more magnetic. I don't know if, if you two know like what it's like you meet a certain person. Sometimes you meet these people and they just have this magnetism about them. Mm -hmm. I feel like whatever that person's yeah. not. Mm -hmm. And I find that Tantrics tend to have this. I can spot a tantric person in your room. And just like, ah, you got it. I feel you, brother or sister. And it's that kind of juiciness of life, that like that just inner inner joy, and inner pleasure in in every moment. You know, like you can have pleasure in, in literally any moment if you practice that. And I know Beth has a lot to say about that too, um, which is why I work her work kind of bounces off each other really well. Yeah. So, so really, I just want to share what I've discovered with, with others in as many different ways as possible. 
Amazing. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's interesting to hear how you describe yourself in each of these um, discussions, because I feel like each time it's a little bit different and we're getting to know different sides of you, maybe, or maybe it's because I guess maybe I'm starting to understand Tantra a little bit more because I'm still very much a newbie. Um, but yeah, I think some of the words now are starting to take on slightly different meaning. So thank you for that, Heidi. And Beth, for those who haven't met you in the group, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your work? Yeah, yeah, it's um, lovely to be here. Thank you for this. Um, I am a pleasure coach, and I noticed that most of us, uh, especially in North America, we are pleasure starved. Um, we didn't grow up in a culture with pleasure being okay. In fact, guilty pleasure is a thing. <laughs> it's, it's guilty. Like we do it, but we feel guilty associated with it, right? And, um, and so I began working around this about four years ago. My background's actually accounting, um, not pleasurable to me. Although it is pleasurable to some, which those are the accountants you should always work with. <laughs> Um, and when I, when I started my work, it was astonishing to me to see that so many people were shut down around pleasure and that in the area of intimate pleasure, uh, physical pleasure, there was such a shutdown and a lacking of a space to speak about it for everyday average people. I call them corporate Starbucks people or like, uh, the general average person, we don't talk about sex we don't talk about uh in a real way i mean some of our cultures we talk and joke but there's lots of actually conversations about it but not in that intimate way and so i started that work and it came um out of a place of my own experience because i grew up um in a highly religious family so there was a lot of um repression or just lack of conversation around that topic and so just opening that up um, allowed me to realize, wow, I have a lot of shame around this, around my body, around, and it just was resonating over and over again with people. And then um, along the way, I discovered a, a typing system for pleasure. It's called Erotic Blueprint, and it's focused specifically on sexual pleasure, but really the concepts are broad and, and pleasure-based in general. Because um, I like, uh, Hi as Heidi said, it's pleasure is in everything. And so yeah, our, we, our ideas do totally bounce off of each other. Because it, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So how you do sex is how you do life and vice versa. So I just love to zoom in on that intimate area because when we can actually clear away any guilt or inhibitions or, or just lack of able capacity to speak of what our desires are in that area, our whole life around pleasure blossoms and sometimes we look at the other areas of our life to be able to talk about our sex life because it's like looking at the sun I say to people I'm like okay sometimes you can't look quite directly at that topic um yeah so then I, I weave in the erotic blueprints and um <clears throat> because they're a, they're a languaging that I was so excited to discover um so there's five types and I know we'll talk more about that on this conversation and so for me what when I found this it was like a gold mine because Yes, you have to deal with what's blocking your pleasure. You have to discover what is your pleasure to begin with. But when you can actually realize that you have an a, a instinctual default pleasure path, and, and then you can have words and you know that other people have others and nothing's wrong or bad. It's just a different liking, a different access to pleasure. The whole, like the shame lifts off just naturally. So uh, it's, it's, yeah. So I love, I love being able to teach that class. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to chat about this topic and to be here also with you, Heidi. I'm looking forward to you coming to town. <laughs> Very soon. Very soon. Please away. Yeah. Looking forward to it as well. Um, so something that came up for me while both of you were speaking, um, I know Heidi is familiar with Alan Watts. Beth, are you familiar with Alan Watts? I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Are you familiar with the teacher Alan Watts? Um, so he was a British uh, teacher in, I guess, the early, starting in the 50s and kind of throughout the 60s and 70s. And he was a great popularizer of um, 
Eastern thought. So Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and really integrating them with Western psychology. Um, so he did a lot of uh, public talks and wrote a, a number of books that are considered like classics. And one of, he does a lot of, or a lot of people have now turned some of his lectures into YouTube videos. And there's a great one where he talks about how, you know, we live in such an advanced society with such amazing technology where, you know, so much power, like at our fingertips, you would think that with so much abundance, we would be like, partying all the time like having these like orgies of ecstasy like throughout the day like that's all we would do because we have so much power and yet most of us work so hard in like these very narrow confined spaces and for pleasure we look at a screen and you know use our thumbs and then we go to sleep and we quickly eat something and then we get back into this thing and it's like our bodies are so sensitive and so open to experience. And yet with all of this opportunity, this is how we live. Like it's so odd. It is. And yet it's been generationally trained into us around how to interact with pleasure. And it's, it's, there's been a morality attached in often cases to pleasure being wrong, um, ex excessive, uh, hard work being good. Like there's, there's different, and, and, and I've been exploring the whole idea of shame and how shame actually plays into being an antithesis, what is the word antithesis? The opposite of pleasure and how shame has been used as a method of communicating boundaries, actually. So it's been so convoluted. Yeah, I, I actually am so excited because I plan to actually, I have, Heidi, I haven't even shared this with you. When you come, we're going to spend some time, I'm sure, talking about this. But I plan to write a book about this idea of shame <clears throat> as it relates to pleasure. And I think it's going, I, I don't know that I'll get into all of the history or I'll just focus on the, on the here and now, the impact, but the history um, of how we came as a civilization to create all this amazing technology was built with these certain structures that also had pleasure be bad and wrong and hard work be good. Mm -hmm. So we don't, it's like, it's like we may have the, 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 the abundance in front of us, but we don't don't have the internal capacity to access it. So that's why these, cl these classes are so important to practice moments of experiential permission to enjoy pleasure. Mm -hmm. and what's really interesting about all of this is how safe we feel in our prisons of hard work. There is mm -hmm. a comfort in the predictability that's there. Mm -hmm. There are of this quote by Marianne Williamson uh, it's not our inadequacy that we fear. Yeah. I need to be paraphrasing. It's not our inadequacy that we fear. It is our, um, it is that we are powerful beyond measure. So one thing that I find in practice, which blew my mind, is that when you're becoming mindful, a lot of tantra practices center around mindfulness and meditation very present with where you are and for the average person it's easier to be present and mindful with your pain than it is with your pleasure and that just floored me when i discovered it there's something like you said that it's built into our conditioning from generation to generation there's this this comfort and knowing that here's my little box and I'll stay in my little box where it's familiar and safe. But pleasure is this thing that you can't control. Pleasure is very related to the divine mm. and things like Kundalini energy. And when you turn that knob open, you open that faucet of pleasure completely, there is no telling what's gonna happen. And if I had to place my money on it, I would bet that what's gonna happen is gonna ruffle feathers. It's not going to fit within the societal norms. It's going to cause attention. And that's so fearful for us because we've got this 
conditioning to be one of the flock, to be one of the herd, to do what everyone else is doing. And pleasure does not do what everyone else is doing. Pleasure is this freshness that just erupts in the most beautiful ways. And that's one of the hardest practices for people coming into Tantra is, can you be fully, fully present and fully meditate on your pleasure, not just your pain? I loved one of your um shares on your event i don't know if it was your tantra 101 but you shared how about so also paraphrasing <laughs> but how about considering instead of comfort consider freedom you you were having people consider that and there was another comparison that you were having. it's like it, we are we are longing so let's say we're in a relationship or wanting to get into a relationship we're longing for a belonging and a, and a, a what we may think is comfort but truly what there is that is underneath a longing, like when we, okay, so I'm gonna tie it back to children, I have kids. When we're children, we're free and pleasure is the mode of operandus. It's like how you are, you're like, what fun can I do today? Rah! Like making the best What's that? Body feels good to touch. Yes. That. It's a supermarket, it's a search. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because you're like, as, like you're wanting to explore and experience, right? And then it slowly gets shut down. But if you are, there's an internal part of us still looking for that. And so then it's like getting into a, a connected uh, relationship or, or moment with someone. We actually long for that and to share that with something, with someone, because love and pleasure are instinctual desires of us humans. But then we come in and then it's because of that like desire to be comfortable then we get nervous of to, if we actually allow ourselves to flow with what the pleasure is it's embarrassing it's 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 like what could happen it's actually a lot of the reason why people don't orgasm because there's that's the ultimate letting go i struggled with that for years and i speak with a lot of women and men who there's a struggle around letting go because the pleasure you don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> So yeah. there's, there's a fear. On that, on that, there's a container for pleasure that mm. each of us has built. And our chances are, our containers are probably not that big mm. relative to our potential. And so what happens is the pleasure builds, the pleasure builds, the container becomes full, mm. and we have to empty it. Mm. And I don't know if, if any of you watching have ever had this experience where almost like you're forcing the orgasm. Like, mm -hmm. you're just like I just want to get it out. Just push it out. Yeah, just get it done. Just, it's like almost too much. It's almost mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Just <sighs> because this, we're pushing our edge on our pleasure. Mm -hmm. and, we're taking our pleasure. and it's not comfortable. It feels different. It feels risky. It feels like maybe surrender could be required. Mm -hmm. And our whole mechanism of mind is trained to keep us in the safe zone. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of factors that are contributing towards getting rid of that energy. But one of the practices in Tantra is to slowly, slowly increase the container for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that point, just stopping your stimulation, a little tantric tip here, a little bonus, uh, you can and build that pleasure in your body. And then just as you get to that point of release, you can pause, stop all movement, and circulate that energy to your whole body. This will expand your container. And you can do that three times and then have your orgasm. But if you do this as a practice over and over, you'll notice that your container for pleasure grows and that what you thought was your peak sexual um, sensation can actually be taken further. It can actually feel even better than you imagined. I love that. I, I talk often about the capacity for pleasure and we, yeah, it's like, and, and it's in every area of our life, right? Oh, maybe I always talk about food. I love food. And I, so you think of a, maybe you like Indian food. Um, I'm sure you do. Sorry, Beth, could I interrupt for a sec? <laughs> and I live in Brampton. There's lots of options here. <laughs> Sorry, Beth, can I interrupt for a sec? Um, I just wanted to ask you to put a, if you don't mind, if you could put a link to your um, next erotic blueprint in the comments. Oh, sure. Yeah. 
um, I just couldn't yeah. find it uh, handy. So if you could okay. do that. Thanks. And I'm noticing um, Paul is on live. I don't know if that, he's still there, but hi, Paul. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. I love it. Um, yeah, okay, I'll find that link for sure. It's on Tuesday uh, next week at Good For Her, um, a really great shop on um, Harvard Street in Toronto. And what kind of um, event space do they have? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I wonder if my, my internet's no it's sometimes it's flaky so it might have been on my side um i was asking what the event space is like at good for her oh it's very intimate it's it's cozy um and, and small but it's cozy it's a nice feel so the shop is on the main floor like when you walk in the, all of the shops and the great things are there and then you go upstairs and upstairs is where the event space is and it holds 15 to 17 people. Um, so it, one thing I like about that is it does stay intimate, especially for these kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, I've... What you were saying, because I was on the edge of my seat, and you were speaking about food in our container for pleasure. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But I won't forget. I'll come back to Indian food and put a container for pleasure. But Leroy, did you... I saw your mouth was opening, too. I think we're on a time delay. Uh, yes, I was just gonna, oh, I was just gonna say that I've passed Good For Her uh, many times because um, CSI, where I used to be a member, uh, was very close. So I passed by Good For Her and I was always like, I wonder what's in there? What's going on? It, honestly, I, Carlyle Jensen, who, who owns it and runs it, has done so for 20 plus years. I'm, I'm a bit of a uh, groupie of Carlyle. <laughs> Because I really, really honor how she shares the word, the, the 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 learnings and teachings, and just really insight about sex. But just normally, like in a normal, everyday, average, for every person, and she really wants people to feel safe and comfortable. So you'll see, even the that when she does her her events at uh, the international sex show. She's got like the brightest lit area. It's orange and white. It's totally friendly. And mm -hmm. I love it. It's just, so the whole shop is like that. You feel totally at ease. It's a sex shop where you don't feel like you're, you know, having to like hover and hide. <laughs> it's really, really comfortable and, and that kind of zone and vibe, right? Yeah. Nice. I love it. So if you have. I'm just reading my, uh, we do have a bit of a delay. Sorry, Leroy. No problem. There. Go ahead, and then I have a memory that's linked to what Beth said that I want to share with you. Um, great. So I was just going to mention to Beth and to anyone listening live or on the replay, um, although it may appear that I love to do interviews with people, and I do, I would love to have other people doing interviews and hosting discussions and basically interacting on this medium. Oh. Um, so, uh, Beth, I know we're going to have some more discussions about this, but if you would actually like to interview the owner of, uh, and it's good for her. Oh, yeah. Is it, that's the name good of it? Yeah, she, yeah, I've interviewed her before. She's lovely to, to hear from. So, awesome. yeah, if you, we, we definitely let's chat about that. That would be great. And I, I am foreseeing, it's like a vision I'm having right now of, an ongoing series of, of talks because this is a very large subject. Yeah. Well, I would love that. I'm a big fan of the conversation. I actually started out calling myself a sex conversationalist because the very first thing I noticed was a missing conversation of just the normal the normalcy of physical interaction with ourselves and physical interaction between humans, even between parent and child, we don't speak of physical interaction. And then of course, sexual physical interaction. So yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, so. All right. And it's really fun to be with Beth in coffee shops and restaurants to witness how you launch into these conversations with complete strength. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> these everyday encounters can go to. I think you blow people's minds. It's really beautiful to watch. <laughs> I forget I even do that. That's so funny, but I do it all the time. 
That's funny. No, except when my children are around, because I really, really get it. that would be so insanely embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but yet, then, then that's another thing that I have, right? Because me, why is that embarrassing? I even ask myself as I speak it, why is it embarrassing? Mm -hmm. And yet there is a level of, okay, just feeling it. Like my daughters are 12 and 9, right? So pretty much anything I say in public is embarrassing. <laughs> So, but anyway, that's the whole other topic. I love talking about the parenting of children around us. Mm -hmm. um, so I forget now, but I feel like I interrupted both of you, and I forget now where I left off. So I think it was Heidi was telling a story. Um, Beth was telling the story, and it reminded Heidi of something. So I will let you two sort it out. <laughs> yeah. So mine is quick, and then we can kind of look back to that. Okay. And hi, Nick. I, Nick has joined us. From Nick. somewhere warm. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, Nick. I just traveled with Nick the other day in Guatemala. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great to have you, Nick. Uh, I just, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, Carlisle's shop and, yeah. and how it's, it's accomplished this, this amazing ability to be a really bright, friendly sex shop that you just want to be in, it reminded me of my time articling. I was articling to become a, a chartered accountant. <laughs> You've got two accountants, <laughs> tantra sexuality people on the call here today. And I remember being in my backyard and crunching through books and books and books. And all I could think about, I wasn't thinking about passive investments or ROI. I was thinking about how do I create a sex shop where people want to come and just spend a the day there, where they want to come and have dinner there, where they want to come and plan their day night there. Right. And uh, obviously I got a little, uh, I changed direction with so many other projects, but I love hearing that someone's doing a similar sentiment. Mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah, but I love, that's a really, now I want to have a conversation with Carla, because how cool is that? Yeah. What you're saying, kind of extending it into a, community space now she's created a vibe of comfort but an actual community space where that becomes a wow that's a really neat idea just throw some good coffee anywhere and people will come and hang out like mm -hmm. I, that's all you need mm -hmm. <laughs> i hang out there <laughs> and the important thing to remember right is that we can use these kind of group discussions that can be private they can be public discussions there can be like one-on-one -on -one conversations that can be had, like small groups of four. Um, you know, we can have a whole bunch of people join a webinar and then separate the men and the women into two different groups and have a um. bit of a chat there, then come back. Then we could put them in activities where they're doing stuff together, then come back together. So yeah, basically anything you can do live, um, you can do virtually except the touching and the smelling and the tasting right now. But that I don't think is too far off. Well, no, I love what you're saying, Leroy, because for me, there's something that's so important about accessibility. Because what I discovered and just in, in my multiple conversations, random ones, is there is a missing space of um, just a comfortable conversation about intimacy and sexuality and body basically just body even and so i love it because the virtual allows us access it allows people access so many people in i grew up small town super small town and so this is even more prevalent in small town in my opinion because there isn't access to workshops like there might be in toronto or other centers so the virtual allows access all over the place i have a client in dubai and she, she has very limited access there. So uh, virtual and even getting on virtual can be tricky because of a lot of limitations with internet, et cetera. But again, like around the world, having these kind of conversations and I love it that, yeah, you can do the breakout rooms now. I was on a call that played around with that. It was really, really neat. Mm -hmm. So the conversation to me is key. It's almost sunset here in India. Ah, oh, nice. So, for a moment, I'm just gonna turn on the lights. Yeah, I saw that drop there. Interesting. Um, what was I gonna say? What was the last thing you were saying, Beth? Oh, I was uh, I was talking about the pleasure capacity issue um, thing and how it's it's general pleasure as well. We we actually have 
and we don't we have a container a current container current size of pleasure and Heidi was sharing that and talking about tantra practice where you can actually pause and allow and teach your your body how to expand in in sexual pleasure mm -hmm. and i was saying that uh, it's truth of pleasure in general because we were brought up in an environment where we weren't practiced that pleasure was good there was actually a a, a morality around too much pleasure being wrong and bad and and attaching pleasure to even to sin in in some in some circles right <clears throat> and so um so if you think about food i was talking about how we even have a, a, a comfort around our own pleasure that we prescribe so let's say your comfort is you know you like indian food and you go to this one indian food restaurant but someone else says oh there's a better one sometimes we even have a hard time going to the better one because we know what we have and we know what it is or like even at a restaurant you may always order the same thing because you know what it is so there's a comfort about around the present pleasure you experience even if it's there's more pleasure available. It's just a natural way and change in general. We have to practice ourselves to do change. So it's related to that. So you can practice, if you don't want to practice in the intimate place of sexual pleasure capacity, you can actually build your pleasure capacity in other areas of life just by exposing yourself and finding out, oh, maybe there's like an even better or different because it's not always about better, it's just about multiple, and that also expands your elasticity around pleasure. We have our I don't know, is it endless? I I would have not I would I don't know. I don't know. I haven't reached the end, so <laughs> of what my pleasure capacity is. And far from it. I I need a pleasure coach constantly in my ear. So thank goodness for Heidi. We are very good friends and colleagues as well. And so we coach each other back and forth because we too, I, I'll speak for myself, I have these limitations going on all the time that I have to speak to and make an intentional choice to let go of that limitation. I'd like more pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and we have some biological realities that are sort of stacking the cards against us. Mm. Like, so you might know the official name for this. It's called the negativity bias or something. Mm. Human beings. Are, are wired actually to be more motivated by avoiding pain than by the possibility of pain. So in our wiring, we are, we are driven to avoid pain, avoid pain. And that's why our comfort zone is so negative to us, to our survival. It Just watch the cruise. The cruise? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just I'll reference because I won't get it. It's a, it's a parent thing. So you're not you don't know. <laughs> sorry. But he, he actually tries to keep them in a cave even when the whole world is collapsing because it was it was to save them and survive. It was survival. So it's cave man, cave woman time, right? When we're on that bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. we're always motivated by avoiding risk, avoiding pain. Yeah. The conversation that we're having today is really only relevant to people who have our basic needs met. If mm. our basic needs are met, we can afford to have these kind of conversations. Mm. If you're on this call today, you know, send a prayer to the universe, you're very blessed. Because we actually can afford to think about pursuing our pleasure. Um, and it's only in those, those upper uh, layers of the triangle that we can consciously look at our biological wiring say, you know what, I think I'm safe. I think there's a relatively good chance that I'm going to make it through this day without dying. And so I can tell my brain that it's safe to pursue my pleasure instead of just running away from me. Mm. Nice. Which goes back to Leroy when you were talking about how advanced we are, how odd that we're not actually enjoying more pleasure. But it's because we're not consciously saying, oh, I'm safe today. I can actually switch my instinctual reaction. I can actually choose higher above my instincts. I can choose above that instinct reaction. It's not built into the automatic program, yeah. but you have to make a conscious choice. Yeah. Daily. Um, and it becomes habitual, and, it becomes, and that's where the capacity grows, because so like you, you just then become more and more okay with knowing oh right okay great so i'm feeling like i might not be sick okay great now now am i and maybe sometimes we aren't there's moments where we're not and we have to deal with something immediate in our life mm -hmm. 
Says. Something that was coming up for me around um, what both of you were saying about our, um, I guess, predisposition for negative news or um, is that how you phrase it? Negative or was it an, another uh, label? I think negativity bias. But I negativity. Sure right. Yeah. So one of the uh, things that I remember watching or reading or something like that um, in terms of like our human evolution is that we forget that, I think we, we sometimes forget that memory was primarily a function of <clears throat> having a, um, you know, a significant moment being imprinted on your memory for future use, right? So a lot of that had to do with food, for example, right? So if you knew where the good food was, then you would survive. If you forgot where the good food was, <laughs> then you wouldn't survive, right? If you remembered where the snakes were, then you, know, you wouldn't get bitten by the snakes. And if you got bit once, you'd really remember that and make sure that you told everyone around you where that happened. And just through hearing that story, they could identify with the experience so much that it's almost like it happened to them. And now they don't go down that path either, right? So you don't have to experience something in order to like have this emotional reaction to it. Um, so... I, I didn't really have a point, but that those were just like a couple of associations that were coming up. And I've been thinking a well, lot. I love what you're saying. Sorry, I'm interrupting again. No problem. Uh, I tie back to what Beth was saying about how this, um, this kind of avoidance of pleasure is passed down from generation to generation. So mm -hmm. It's almost coming down in our DNA. Mm -hmm. All the people that have had this approach before and evolutionarily we got to evolve past this survival phase although do you think yeah. it's really that old because this development i would say of lacking pleasure feels like it's relatively new given how old our species is and um so it's new and yeah i guess it hasn't been around that long i guess that's what new means but <laughs> I think um, different cultures actually approach it differently. Yeah, very much so. I think that, again, I like to relate it to food. If you see cultures that actually enjoy food and music, uh, they tend to actually get pleasure more intrinsically. So that was actually the point that I wanted to leave you guys with, was how do you feel hunger? So I consider uh, hunger to be a primary drive and sex to be a primary drive. So how do you feel that those two <clears throat> are related and how are they different? Are you speaking hunger in general or hunger for food? Um, well, I've never thought of it that way. So I, I, I perceive the hunger for food to be a primary drive. Okay, yeah, um, so hunger for, because I would use the word, same word hunger and maybe I'm just borrowing from the food and I've, I've just gotten so used to using the word hunger in general, but I, I use the hunger for sex as well. Um, but yeah, no, I guess hunger originally would be for food. So, Well, that actually, that's a very good point bacteria. because it's a desire, right? So I'm, I've been recently mm -hmm. playing around a lot with um, like first principles and basic categories, right? So we could have sex and hunger as two separate categories, but then above that would be desire, for example, right? So sex and hunger are both part of desire. And then, you know, I would say, is there, so that is a big mystery for me, right? Is where do desires come oh, from? Oh, I love, I love this triangle. This is interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna, meet, when you're saying hunger, you're meaning for nourishment, for food. Well, so that last point now, right? So if we have desire as the top category, I've, I yeah. always find that one kind of interesting because we are basically ruled by desires, like hierarchies of desire, and we don't control yeah. which desires we become aware of in the moment. 
right? So people talk a lot about choice, and this is something, this is a word I don't really use much anymore because I don't really see how choice kind of fits in. When you, when you start to look at this process very carefully, it becomes very frustrating because what you think are two separate things end up being the same, and there's no place to put choice in. It's like you've got a, a jar and you filled it with rocks and now you've got this one big rock left called choice and there's like no room to put it in. And I know this, this is, is a very topic. unpopular this, position. This is, this is phenomenal topic. So, okay, can I play around with yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, and I like how you said play around because in a lot of the discussions that I've been having, it's not about presenting a fully formed idea. It's about articulating yeah. half formed thoughts and seeing what comes up, yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's the best. It's the best, best kind of conversation. Okay, so it's so interesting because even just owning that our desires, and I, you've used a particular word that is interesting, rule us. I think you used the word rule. I heard rule, or I, I, I translated it to rule, that our desires rule us. And it's so interesting because rule takes away that I have, it's like it put on me. So it's a very interesting choice of words that our desires rule us. I don't disagree with you. I just would have, I see it like our desires drive us, which feels to me, I'm always wanting to feel free <laughs> constantly having that. I think that's a desire for me and desires for me are very closely linked to my core values. The things that drive me that are of in, intrinsic importance to my essence, to my being, to me are all linked to desire as well. And, and then we go back to talking about as children and, and desires. Like there's such a, like, like you were saying, <clears throat> We, are, we don't really have a choice what desires rule us in any given moment. Like that, what an interesting thought. Because as a child, you look at that and there is an, uh, an erraticness or a randomness often to what desire they happen to have in the moment. And I find that maybe the most interesting thing is we as humans, because children also, well, I think originally they know, but there's a point along the way where we have a very hard time articulating our true desire. <clears throat> and I think that that's where choice gets all mixed up. Yeah, and I wanna jump in here okay. because I think about this a lot too. <laughs> and I feel like the, there's an inverse relationship with how connected I am to myself and how much my desire serves me. Mm. So, mm. I believe at the deepest level, my desire is union. And mm. I want to experience union with the divine. That is my deepest driving desire. If I feel disconnected from myself, if I don't feel like I can attain that or I deserve that, I push it away. I say, okay, that's not possible here. And then I'm left with this gaping hole. And I gotta fill that hole somehow. So then I reach for a secondary desire. And this isn't my true desire. So maybe this comes in the form of alcohol, or maybe this comes in the form of uh, food, or any kind of distraction that's gonna work to fill the void of me not pursuing my true, true desire. And so I think the more, feels like the more connected we are to ourselves, the more we're aware of our desires, we're consciously following them, and the more our desire is going to serve us, the more it's our real desire. Because I look at it like we got two levels of desire. We have the actual desire, and then we have the fill-in desire when we don't get what we actually want. So an example that I like is, you've got someone who's going out to the bar every night drinking a half bottle of whiskey, is their desire really to drink a half bottle of whiskey? Is that really their true desire? Or is their desire to find a way to connect with people? And that's the only way that they can find that connection. So I think it's very helpful for us to look at which, 
desire is, is ruling me right now? And is there a desire under that that I really, really want more? Because the crappy thing, I've experienced this, uh, crappy thing is the more you pursue that uh, secondary desire, the less satisfied you feel because you can't satisfy a need that you never had in the beginning. And I stole that from my shadow work mentor, Gary. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah. That image of, um, kind of like lower desires and then or authentic desires and then kind of these compensating desires. Um, That's a great way to say it. Compensating mm -hmm. desires. I like that. So yeah, I, you know, I had a weird astrology reading once and more than once, but this one guy, he was telling me, you know, we were talking about the reading and suddenly I, I had this thought and I thought, so the more you're connected to yourself and your essence, the more you're going to like what's in your reading, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, the less you're connected to your truth, the less you're going to like your karma or your, mm -hmm. you can say fate if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was fascinating way to think about it and i'm still exploring that in my life it's, it's a theory it's a yes. working theory but i think there's some truth to it i fully agree and i feel like what he said is very connected now to um yeah i'm not sure where the kind of the catalyst was but i feel like there was a moment where there was all of these separate ideas that seemed paradoxical and then at one point, one of them shifted a little bit and then it made all of them like fall into a pattern. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. These are all connected somehow. Like they're not separate and they're not that paradoxical anymore. Like there's still a, a basic paradox where it's like, this is beyond me, but it's not the same type of conflict that I had. And a, I think a big part of that um, came to mind, and I don't really have a, an answer to this question, but I feel just holding the question is interesting. So in your, from your perspectives, is any outcome of one choice better or worse than any other? Or does it have more value than any other? Or an even simpler way of saying it, does any one experience you have have any more intrinsic value than any other? Because basically choice is um, a desire to have something that's better, right? Which is also a paradox. I'll just add before I let you comment. This is so much fun. What a great topic. So. And you know what I'm thinking of right now is Alan Watts. Yes. He a great story about this. But I, yes, the, the farmer story with the sun. The sorry? The seven year dream. Uh, yes. Seven -year okay, so I'm, I'm just going to finish my point and then I'll let you two uh, riff off of it, right? So because that basic um, desire of choice is to always go for the better, right? We want to choose the better option always, right? That would make sense. But when we look at our lives, we realize that sometimes the worst experiences of our lives are the most valuable for what they teach us. So it's not like we would want in any realm to avoid those things. And we wouldn't want to choose them unless. <clears throat> and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Such a great question. <laughs> I'm curious about the story. I don't know Alan Watts, and now I'm wanting to read. And I'm not so. sure if it's the same one I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of the one where... Um, like there's an old man sitting and his horse runs away and the neighbors come and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry your horse ran away. And he's like, yeah, well, we'll see. Is that the one? Heidi? It's a different one. It's a different one, yeah. In, in this one, there's an imagined time box that lets you control your dreams. Ah, yes. And you go to bed and you get to choose whatever you want. And it's a very vivid, very real dream. So you go to bed and you're like, wow, like, I want to go to all these exotic places and eat all this amazing food and have this great sex. And you wake up and 
Nice, nice dream. You go to bed the next day, go back to the magical dream box, and have more of your fantasies unfolded in front of you. And then you keep going like this, night after night after night, and you explore every potential realm of your fantasies. You experience your life exactly as you think it should be, only the good, no nothing, no obstacles, no traffic, no relationship hurdles, just the stuff that you want. And then eventually, this is going on for years and years, decades, and eventually you start to feel this sense of boredom. And you're like, well, this is super predictable. Like, I know exactly what's going to happen in the night. And so you decide to fill in a little surprise. Oh. And it's like, roll the dice. Like, I'm just going to let one factor be left to chance. Mm -hmm. And you have that dream, and it's more exciting. It brings more life into it. And then the next night, you're like, that was fun. I'm going to throw a couple factors to chance. And you keep increasing it because each time you notice that there's a beautiful contrast. There's this stuff that feels amazing, that's so beautiful, and then there's these little challenges. In it. And then he asks at the end of, of his story, so what do you think happens at the end of the 70 years? Where are you sitting at the end of 70 years? <laughs> and you're sitting exactly where you are right now today with all of the surprises, all of the things outside your conscious choice, with all of that polarity between the pleasure and pain, the triumph and the, and the sorrow. You're sitting exactly right where you are right now. And I love the point that he's making because he's saying all of this striving that we do to get to a place where, oh, okay, finally, it's all in order. It's all as it should be, is, is like a dog chasing its tail. It's not even what we truly want in the end. So I found it such a great motivator to just drop that and try to find that pleasure in whatever is here. Because on some level, like you're saying, Leroy, you know that choice. It's it it was our choice, and it's not our choice, and that's the paradox. It's you get to the same place. Yeah. And we're getting really deep. <laughs> and I keep on. Well, I, I adore it because when you were when you were talking first of all of this triangle, Leroy, the, the thought that came into my mind is around choice and desire. Choice almost is the playing, but desire is the the sensation of peacefulness. I mean, so that means this, I'm playing around with this in my own life to mm -hmm. discover what this is. In fact, uh, a little bit more of the context what I'm playing around is what does it look like to be have a structure of sorts, but very pliable within the structure. So playing around in a practical world, playing around like in my business, how do I have a vision and goals and plans, or maybe I don't even call them that. <clears throat> Uh, but they are very much in line with desire and flow and, and creativity and all of that. So I'm, I, coming from accounting to sex uh, and pleasure uh, realm, they're, they seem, appear like opposites, but I do think they blend. And I think it is actually in the conversation of desire and choice because choice is very much around goal plan. Like I have control over my, my future. And actually, I should take control over my future to make my future be what I want it to be. To me, that's very much a choice realm. And, um, and I long to have that part. There's something about that, right? So then, but in the desires, the desires are, they're deeper. They're, they're the thing that I, I, I get to uncover to, to, to find the truth of my desire. Like what you're saying, Heidi, around that, that the true, the authentic desire. And, and then there's, there's other desires that I think might be it. And that's the only the perspective I have in this moment because I, I haven't been able to actually allow myself to see the true or it just hasn't been revealed, whatever, however you see that. So it's almost like the path to being, to you even said it, walking toward your true desire, something. There was like, when you spoke of the authentic desire, you spoke of it as a, as a emotion, a, 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 a a movement toward as opposed to the destination of our authentic desire like there's a a, a a space where i am living toward my authentic desire 
and there's satisfaction to what my perfect desire. Whereas choice feels quite finite, and choice feels like, but I believe they play with each other. So take it to something more concrete, like if I desire, okay, so I'm going, Heidi knows this, because I was on a treadmill, and she called me from India one time, so I'm going to the gym every morning, uh, except for this morning, so I'll be going later in the day. <laughs> so my, I have a desire to, my, and I'm not even sure this is the, the, the authentic, but I have a desire to feel fully in tune with a, a strength and an energy in my body and my mind, because I go to the gym also for my, I do some meditation there. So I, I just, I'm wanting this space of, like the whole of being of me is working together. And, um, and so that's a desire. Now the goal or the choice is to go to the gym at 5 a.m. in the morning. Does that choice mean it's the right way or the way I'm going to get it? Well, it's almost like I could choose to go to 8 a.m. I could choose to go to a different gym. I could choose to do it at home. I feel like when we're on the path toward our desire, choice just becomes maybe the dice that you roll. And it's like, okay, well, I could do it this way today. That could be interesting. Oh, but maybe it's not that way. But the, there's the path of being on the path of our true desire. I feel like there's something there around choice and desire. Mm, I love that so much. And when you speak about it, there's this beautiful romance between choice and desire and this huh. interplay where they're moving in the world in union but also with this this magnetism that's kind of pulling them together and apart yeah. and it reminds me so much of us as, as dual beings mm. existing in the spirit realm and also in this tangible physical realm right. and that desire as our spirit mm. our spirit desire that's the fire that burns in mm. us coming back to our essence and then the choice is it's like we take desire is infinite right there's there's no limit to desire and i by the way i think there's no limit to pleasure either to answer this question so we take this in, infinite realm of desire and every time we make a choice we're narrowing that down mm. we're bringing that and the cool thing is to make it real we have to narrow it down Right. Three-dimensional real. Uh -huh. realm, we have to actually choose. Like, okay, you know, quantum physics. I know nothing about quantum physics, but I heard this thing about potentiality and how we have the potentiality to exist everywhere at once. That's mm -hmm. how all the smallest molecules really work. So in order to actually exist, you gotta choose one place. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. exist everywhere, but where am I gonna choose to exist on? And talk about the choice of the dice that you roll. <coughs> that article. Okay, I'm going to be here right now. I'm going to be there right now. You still have the potential for everywhere. Hmm. I love that. Conversation. Yeah. I had no idea it was going here. I love it. Thank you, Leroy. Okay, I feel like I have one more question. Um, and then I think we should probably start to wrap, or at least I need to wrap up. You guys are welcome to stay on as long as you like. I can keep the room open. Um, so if it turns out that there was no free choice, no free will, if that could be demonstrated to you, do you feel that your life would lose meaning? Instantly, my reaction was I would be mad. That was my instant reaction when you said that, that I would be really, really angry. You have to remember, I grew up in uh, Christianity, and this was a conversation constantly. There were the two, and I can't remember now, but there was like a Calvinism mm -hmm. method and a blah, 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 other method, right? Where one is you have free will and one is you do not, and it's all or preordained. And I remember having this conversation discussion, and I would, so my instinct or my automatic reaction is that I would be mad, but... I'm not sure that that's actually a truth for me in this moment, because there's also something that I've discovered around surrender, and I've had to revisit these words, because these words used to trigger me, and they still have like a, oh, there's a version over here of surrender, and then there's this version I'm now playing around with. <clears throat> because if you think about it, there's absolute joy when you go to an all-inclusive resort. There's absolute pleasure in being fully taken care of. 
I often wish I was my child because the meals get cooked, they can play, and I wish I could, you know, we think, oh, childhood is that, that most amazing time. Well, there was very little free will in those, in, in those spaces, and we try to give that to our ch children. So I think that the idea of freedom is really, really pleasurable to us, but in reality, freedom can be terrifying also. So it, I, don't, I don't know, I would, I, it would just be, and we wouldn't know anything other. If that was true, we wouldn't know anything else. Um, yeah, part of me would fight it, and part of me would be like, wow, okay, I'm going to go on this ride. Let me just come and, and get to get used to what this ride is and allow the ride to be. And then I think there would be, a, I would find a peace in that. So, interesting question. Nice. And I'm having trouble imagining that. So, I guess there would be an initial paradigm breakdown. So really? balls I, I, this is this is going to relate okay but bear with me you know those balls they're plastic balls i'm such a mom okay so these balls are plastic and then they have little pokey things and you can squish them um but i i'm imagining a purple one where it's purple and it's like a squishy ball but it has tons of little pokey things out mm -hmm. and it's fun to play with mm -hmm. okay it's like a the, the idea was like each little pokey thing is okay one is tidy and one is best probably mm. right but we're all one. Because I've been playing around with this lately because I, I'm coming back to, to find my spirituality, whereas I had to really turn that off for a period of time because I, I really, I put a lot of blame on my, my upbringing. And so now that the blame is gone, it's like, oh, wow, I'm highly soulful. <laughs> all right, now what? And so it's like there's a oneness, but an individuality, but maybe still one. I don't know. Because what? It, okay, so, yeah, that's a whole other call and conversation <laughs> that we or over over coffee or wine we will have when you're in town. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that visual. Because I'm now going to spend the rest of my night imagining everyone through those little numbers <laughs> in that ball. Everyone's like. <laughs> so one way. One uh, <laughs> that is a great image. I like that too. Um, so one additional analogy, I guess, or image, I guess, that I've played with that has helped me understand um, why I don't have free will, and I guess basically how it's intimately tied with the illusion of my ego, right? Because right now, the only thing that I can I'm really identify with is this ego called Leroy. And I used to think that it was that thing that made choices, even though it was always like in conflict, right? I'd want to do something and I wouldn't. Why? If I had free choice, I should just be able to do it, right? Right. So the one analogy that kind of helped me understand this was if I were to give you the power to go back and spend a year, let's say, or even just a day to start with, a day in your childhood and you could experience that full 24 hours. Now, you wouldn't know which day it was, but it would happen, you know, within a given year. So when you were five years old, for example, and you would get to experience it in real time and experience everything that happened and it would feel like it was actually happening again, but you would have an awareness that it wasn't but you wouldn't be able to change a thing. You would just be able to experience it with your adult um, you know, awareness. So you'd be able to go back, you'd be able to experience it, know that it wasn't real, but experience it fully, and then come back. Would you take that opportunity? Hell yeah. 
Heidi? Hmm. I don't know. I think yes. And are you saying you get to choose the day or is no, it random? It's random. It's random. So it could just okay. be, you know, a really boring day. Nothing special happens, nothing great happens. But it's so, you get to experience it fully for one day. My answer is yes. And the reason is I feel like it could give me more perspective. So yeah. I don't know that I would enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's key, like right? I mean, things the second time around that I missed the first time. I have things clicking into place. Oh, okay. That's why I'm like that. Yeah. That's <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And what I've if I've been doing a, a pseudo version of this because every once in a while I'll go back to my um I'll go visit my parents. And on three occasions over the last uh several months, I have visited churches that I grew up in as a child that I don't remember I don't go to church anymore. And I had a, a sense of time travel back to when I was a child and the level of perspective I got insane. So yes, I would totally do that. So this kind of leads to a chain now of, so would you go back for two days? Would you go back for three days? Would you go back for a week? Would you go back for a year, right? And you could keep asking these questions until you ask yourself, would at the end of my life, would I be able to go back and experience it all with my full awareness, but I wouldn't be able to change a single thing, not a moment. And then if you say, I would never do that. and then if you say no, does that mean you would want to erase the memory of that life? Because what a great line of questioning. No. Yeah, I feel like a lawyer, and I feel like I'm dealing with what do they call it? A um, uh, the witness is a hostile witness. Your Honor, may I treat this witness as hostile? Granted, and then you could just ask really pointed questions, right? Yes or no? Yes or no? That's all we're looking for, Miss Ostrander. <laughs> there could be. So anyway, I, I think you, you can see where this uh, is leading. And like we've said, this could go on for very long. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Do, do either of you have any last thoughts on this one? Although I feel like we're leaving right at the best part. I know. It's like the cliffhanger for the next. Yeah. That was, um, no, you've given me a lot of food for thought right there at the end. Thank you. I'm going to, as I'm on the treadmill, I'm going to actually think about that because if I don't want to relive my life from past to now, would I then choose differently from this moment forward so I might relive with my life? Like what, what, what would that be like that I would say yes to that from this point point forward? Mm -hmm. That just, that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think the answer is always no, because I'm a bit greedy for experience. I want to experience mm. the maximum number of things that I can. So mm -hmm. that seems awfully boring. Why would I repeat something? Well, what if it never took away from what you can currently experience? Like it, it didn't. Oh, so I'm simultaneously. Oh, what happened to Beth? Where's Beth? Come back. Don't leave yet. The pleasure coach disappeared in a cloud of pleasure. <laughs> Hopefully she'll come yeah, back. Right back on. Um, so are you saying simultaneously I can experience what I'm doing now and that? Yeah, because you're, you're going back with your current awareness, right? So it's almost like you're stopping time now, going back to experience it. And it's just like the Alan Watts analogy, right? You, you can, you could have one dream that lasts seventy years, right? But you're I only keep living my current life. And you keep living I your. I like my current life. I want to keep you moving in that direction, so I can be experiencing that. Yeah. And changes and developments in that while I'm going back. So you can go back, and you're not actually moving forward in your current time. Like you can f stop time now. No, 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 thank you. You wouldn't want to. No, so you're not losing anything. You're only gaining. You're not. You you something that I've already experienced. Yeah. I want to gain things that I have not yet experienced. 
Um, okay, so part of this line of questioning begins with, is reality cyclical? But we won't get into that now. I think this is a, a, a nice time to segue back into the real. I'm still watching, but for me, this has been so much fun, like sitting around in our living room. Exactly. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about the upcoming events? And when are you back? I will be in the city of Toronto for March 29th and March 31st. Like you're arriving on March 29th? I'm arriving on the 27th. Ah, okay. So I've got a, a three-day trek. <laughs> oh, you know what? Hold on a second. I locked the room. I forgot. And that's why Beth can't uh, oh. join. Oh, okay. Well, let's get her back. So maybe I'll just share a little bit while we're... Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm going from Goa to Delhi to there she London. is she's back. sorry about that my my uh i didn't get a warning that my battery was dying ah uh, okay glad you're back i was just sharing a little bit about uh what i'm going to be doing uh when i'm in toronto in a few days now Yay. yes it was really hard to narrow down which events to offer i wanted to do seven and i whittled it down to two so Friday the 29th, Tantric Speed Dating. Uh, if you're looking to make conscious connections or know people who are, this is a super fun way to do it. And people tell me, even if I don't get a date, I don't care. The event felt so good and so heart opening that I felt closer to myself at the end. So there's many reasons to come. And uh, then on the 31st, I'm doing my six hour Tantra 101. Some of the topics that I touched on, we'll go into in greater detail. And the beauty of the in-person class is you get to experience. So I'll be sharing practices where you can become more aware of, of your chakras. We go quite deep into the chakras. We don't just talk about the color flags and what they represent, but you'll walk through an experience and see how you could do the exact same day, seven different ways, depending on which chakra that you are focused in. And so it's kind of like parallel realities at our fingertips. We'll, we'll go into that a little bit and talk about sexual energy and how this can be used to do everything from making lunch for someone to creating a, a winning project at work to uh, relating to someone that you're not even sexually attracted to. Uh, it's, it's a great resource that is much more than just sex. And we'll talk about what is Tantra. We didn't talk about that in this call. But this is a big question that I get. What the heck is Tantra? No one knows. <laughs> and I don't have like a succinct answer for you, but we'll talk a little bit about what is not Tantra and some of the things under this high umbrella of Tantra. And uh, so many more, so many more things. Uh, but I hope that you know everyone that's there leaves with a practice, the foundations of a Tantra practice that you can keep doing after I leave. Uh, and then I'm going to, to Edmonton and offering a bunch of different shops there. So it'll be a short and sweet visit, but uh, I continually feel called to Toronto, so I have a feeling I'll be back sooner rather than later. Great. Thank you, Heidi. And Beth, would you like to talk about any upcoming events? So you've got the Erotic Blueprint event coming up. Yeah, yeah but first I'd like to say something about Heidi um, and her events. Just like we were talking about Carlisle Jensen up at the beginning, the the vibe at Heidi's events are insanely comfortable and everyday average people to if you feel you're eccentric and wild and crazy, like it's a really welcoming, easy space to enter into. One of the reasons why I fell in love with you, Heidi, and how why I align myself and why now we've become super awesome friends. <laughs> because the space uh, that you hold for people to do this kind of work is really remarkable. So, um, so if you can come to her events, I highly recommend it. Um, for me, I'm I holding yeah, I'm holding a couple of events coming up. The one that's uh, ahead of Heidi's events, which would be great to take in tandem, is the erotic blueprints. Erotic Blueprints is a type system so that we all have one or multiple types 
of pleasure that are our pathway to pleasure, our immediate, in, uh, uh, how did, one of the husbands that came, he was thrilled to find out his wife. She's like, mm, this is the key to unlock her pleasure? I <laughs> because we don't know. There, there are five of them. There's energetic, sensual, sexual, which we often think is the only pleasure, right? That, and it's only one type of five. Uh, kinky, which is often misunderstood, but it's really just someone who loves what's naughty to them. It's not a typical kinky, what we think kinky is. It might be very different for someone else. And the last is the shapeshifter, the chameleon, the person who actually can be turned on and is turned on naturally in all of those areas. So there, are, and uh, so we go into it quite deeply, what your typing is, um, what sexual stage you're in, uh, what are pathways to pleasure that actually show up, maybe show up as challenges, actually. And we were talking a little bit about this in life, where would we choose the tough path or the easy path? Well, actually, sometimes challenges are what give us our, our most, is where the, like, the hidden pleasure is. So we talk about all these things, we get really practical, and we play a couple of uh, games that are completely closing on. I always want to tell people that. Um, and uh, you really learn a languaging and an understanding of your pleasure and how to then start to communicate that and even discover your own pleasure in your own head. We often don't even have language enough to know our pleasure. So it's a great thing to do before you come to Tantra, actually, because Tantra will allow you to embody it even further. Um, and you have this languaging in, in, in kind of in the, in the background, and then you can embody it and bring it into your soul level as well. It's beautiful um, in combination. So because of that, I wanted to offer a discount. If you take my class um, and Heidi's, we'll, we're going to figure out some discount for that so that we can um, encourage that trio. Um, or one, two, because it depends. If you're in relationship, you may not want to go into speed dating. Um, although, I think that would be fun even for couples to go to speed dating. I wanted to talk to you about that, to do some yeah, version of, um, right? Yeah. 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 If you're in a monogamous relationship, it's a bit of a tease to be up ahead of the Yeah. Yeah. But how will people access the discount though? Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm bit, currently, I just have them reach out to me privately uh, as, as just send me a Facebook message. It's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, because it depends which, which class you're going to go to. So then we can send you the correct link and the correct promo code. So that's both okay. standard. And I do have to return the compliment because uh, every year I invite you, Beth, to the Canadian Tantra Festival. I'm looking across the country for the facilitators that I think make the most impact on people. And you know, if you haven't been to one of Beth's workshops, she does, you do live coaching in your workshops. I've seen you take people through an obstacle that's been there for years and move them in real time through to the other end. So, yeah, uh, I, I highly recommend your work. And the erotic blueprint is, it's fun. You know, anything that we can type ourselves and be like, I'm this, it's <laughs> there's something about that that our psyche just loves. I know, so we can classify. We're always trying to classify, yeah. And there is another workshop I'm doing in April. I can't actually remember the date. I'll put a link in it to, to it as well, Leroy. But it's around um, those of us who grew up in religion. So it's around converting your religious uh, shame into soulful pleasure, uh, soulful intimacy. And um, it's a really powerful workshop where you get to actually own the ugly and own the beauty and then really move beyond what limitations you may have acquired from, and you may not even know you've acquired. Some people are shocked when they come out of there feeling like a real hope that, wow, okay, I didn't know I had this on my, my shoulders that's holding me back from pleasure. And some people knew it, and that's why they come. So it's a really cool workshop to, to walk through. Amazing. Thank you. And I would like to thank both of you again for joining us on the broadcast. It was... <laughs> Uh, this one was quite unique. It definitely went longer than most. We're coming on an hour and 20 minutes, where most of my interviews last about half an hour. Um, so thank you to both of you. It's been great. I'm going to ask both of you to hang on the line while I close off the Facebook Live. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, just going to read out. Uh, there was someone who shared a link for Heidi and I to look at. I didn't catch the name or I can't remember the name now. 
but there was a link so i'll go and check that link out thanks for sharing that there was an interesting link heidi i'll share it with you too but great looking forward to it. thanks for posting that so thank yeah. you again elena lalita stacy paul mohammed uh nick praz and michael and just before we wrap up i am going to read a quote that Praz left us, and it's called Union with the Divine. Yes, one should always be drunk. You have to be always drunk as time slowly erodes you down to dust and mud. You have to be continually drunk. It's the only way. Drunk on art, poetry, or wine, whatever intoxicates you the most, but be drunk. If you wake again and come to your senses, drunkenness diminishing, the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, the clock, everything that is flying, everything that is groaning, everything that is rolling, everything that is singing, everything that is speaking, ask them what time it is. The wind, wave, star, bird, clock will answer you. It is time to be drunk. <clears throat> A slave and a martyr to the inexorable march of time can only save himself by being drunk. Always be continually drunk. And that was brought to us by a young man named Charles Baudelaire. That, that's stunning. I've never heard that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Pras. Yes, thank you, Pras. And thank you, Charles. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. Have yourself a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.